Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good morning. What a wonderful welcome. And it's great to be with you. And I just want to say on behalf of my wife and our family, thank you very much for receiving us. Uh, we definitely feel loved and we're very excited about what the Lord has. Thank you, Pastor Ashwin and, and leadership here. So this morning I'm uh, speaking on uh, the 23rd Psalm, verse 4, comfort through life's trials. The message is, in the midst of dark trials of life, we are assured of the shepherd's presence. Nothing can separate us from his love. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Shall we stand and I'll read God's word? 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. You may be seated. I became a believer in Jesus over 48 years ago, and this was the very first psalm I memorized. And it has been a psalm that's brought me great comfort during difficult times. And I pray it'll be a blessing this morning as we, we dive into it and look at it. And the thought that I want you to take home today is this. That nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. That's a wonderful, wonderful thought. And we know that because of the promises that God has given us in his word. And you'll look and see that there is a contrast between the first three verses... And the last three verses, the first three verses, I really like the first three verses. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. What a picture of leading, comfort, rest, strength, provision, protection, uh, guidance, and destiny. Like just, you know, you could, and I remember as a young believer going to bed at night and just allowing and reading and repeating in my mind over and over, washing my mind with that sense of God's security. And it's such a picture. Uh, Look at the emphasis. The Lord is my shepherd. It's all about the Lord. The first three verses, the emphasis are the Lord. I love it says he restores my soul. The word used there, restore, is also the same word as repentance. And what it literally means to is return. Repentance is returning to the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, it's the goodness of God that leads a person to repentance. It's God's goodness. And that return is not God beating up on us, but inviting us back, helping us get on the right path. You know, we, we as sheep, we, you know, the narrow path to heaven is well worn on the edges, if you know what I mean. We, you know, like sheep stray, but God's there and he, he guides us, he leads us, he brings us back. It's such a beautiful picture of contentment. That word, uh, I will lack nothing or shall not want. I think Pastor Ashwin uh, did a great job by explaining it. It's not about us uh, having this kind of uh, 
uh, glum, like self-centered satisfaction, but rather a contentment in the Lord. I love the way Paul put it in Philippians. He said he's learned whether in lack or in abundance to be content. And that's that place where we're, we're content in God because of who God is. He's our provider. He, so we have this really wonderful pastoral picture, and he uses the illustration of a shepherd, and we're his sheep. And I, I hate to say this, but sheep are pretty dumb. You know, th that's not a reflection on us. It's just, it's a metaphor explaining how we, we can trust God beyond our own ability to know. Sometimes we just don't know what the future's going to hold. I don't know if you've been given a bad diagnosis or some bad news. We all go through trials and tragedies in life. The comfort here is that God's with us. You know, he says, you know, the Bible says that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. I remember the first thought I had when I came to Christ was this thought, there's two of me living in this body now. It's not just one of me. God Jesus lives inside of me. And the Bible says that he who is joined to the Lord, we are one with Christ. That's why the Spirit of God that dwells in us when we receive Christ is the same Spirit of God that sits at the right hand of God. Did you think of that? And that's why we're seated in heavenly places. And by the way, seated means we finish from self-effort. Jesus completed the work. He's now seated at the right hand of God, and we're in Christ, and he's in us. And so we positionally, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's good news this morning, that we have that. That's this picture of rest. We're resting in God. But then we come to, uh, we come to this other little place. It says, yea, in the King James, or even though. That's a hinge. We're coming to... Uh, there's a change here, even though I. See, the change is from the Lord, the first three verses, and he's doing all these beautiful things, and he is. But then there's this even though. I, I'm not sure I like even those. Because even though, even though means there's some other stuff coming, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I was, as I meditated on, these last three verses are from the human perspective of what we're going through. It's not about a different place. It's about a different uh, attitude. It's about a different perspective. God wants to say what you're going through. You're go you might be going through some even those. Or as Paul says, all things. All things work together for good for those who love Christ. Did you read the list of all things? Persecution, famine, sword, nakedness. Uh, we don't like, I don't like all things, and I don't like even those personally. I'm just going to be honest with you. I... Uh, the, even those kind of make me a little nervous. But the point is, whatever you're going through, God's perspective is that he's going to use it for good, that you're not going to be alone, that you're joined to the Lord, that you're one spirit with the Lord, and that he's got a plan and a purpose. We're going to take a look at that. I love what uh, uh, Philippians uh, 1, six says. It says that, uh, that he will complete it until the day. He who began a good work in you will complete it. That's confidence in who God is. And so the key here in this, these two things is having trust in the nature and character of God. And so look at what it says about God. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13, starting. It says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is a final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I'm so glad that it depends on God's faithfulness, not on our faithfulness. Our job is to trust in the character and purpose of God. That's why we have this wonderful psalm. 
And I remember sharing this with a friend of mine who was a professor at a Bible school. And I said, you have these two different perspectives. You have, you have God's perspective, and man's, but it's talking about the same event from two different perspectives. And he says, well, that's a chiastic structure. And I said, like a, a chiastic what? What's a chiastic structure? He says, well, the Greek letter chi is like the English letter X. And it's two lines that are uh, diametrically opposed to each other, but both of them give the picture. So often what we see and we look at our circumstances, we think we feel God's forsaken us. We feel what's happening. This seems to contradict everything. What, where's the goodness of God? Where's the presence of God? Where's the joy, the peace? Why do I have these trials? Where's God in the midst of it? And the answer is, he's right there. He's with you. But it takes the eyes of faith by looking at God's word and believing his character beyond the circumstances. And that's the key to understanding. We need both perspectives. You can't help but have a human perspective because you're human. It's okay to say you're disappointed. It's okay to express how you feel. It's important to be honest with where you're at and with who you are. But we don't stop there. We come to God's perspective. The Jewish people in the wilderness, when they were complaining, he says, why did God bring us out to this wilderness to kill us? They didn't understand that God had a bigger purpose. But God needed to teach them to trust him in spite of circumstances. My question this morning to you is, are you going through circumstances that are shaking you to your very core that you need to trust God in? Because God has a plan for everything. There's nothing where the sovereignty and the goodness and kindness of God is not with you in whatever you're going through. And if you're a child of God this morning, you can be assured that the Lord is with you, that the Lord has a plan and the Lord will bring you through it. But here's the thing. You have to make a choice to trust God continually. And it's as we trust God, that's where intimacy comes from. It's through trusting God in our circumstances that we understand that God is faithful. So this key is so important, having faith in the character of God. I love what it says in Psalm 37, 25. This is what the psalmist says. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging bread. And I want to say something here. Sometimes it takes from being young to growing old to understand the faithfulness of God. Sometimes our job is to hold on to God during the trial because trials are not forever. When you get through the trial, you can look back and say, I see the faithfulness of God. But there may be times during the trial where you do feel forsaken. You're tempted to feel forsaken. And that's where we look beyond the trial by faith. The word for hope is a very interesting word. I remember someone saying to me one time that hope was the most negative word in the English language. And I thought, where did you get that from? He says, because so many times I've hoped for things that never materialized. Well, I said, the Bible calls that the hope that disappoints. But we have the hope that doesn't disappoint. You know, the biblical concept of hope is a 100% sure thing that has not yet been seen. That's what biblical hope is. And our hope is in the Lord. Because when our hope is anchored in Him, it's beyond the circumstances. Our circumstances might, might not materialize the way they, that we want. But if our hope is in the Lord, God will bring us exactly to the place that He has. And our ultimate hope, by the way, is in heaven. This life is temporary. We're, this is not our home. I like what Max Lucado said, if God has given you the gift of sorrow, he's preparing you for something more important, for eternity. Because this life will never satisfy us. As believers in Jesus Christ, in this world, we are fish out of water. This is not our destiny. This all is preparation for an eternal purpose. And so our hope really is not the hope of heaven, a hope in the person. Jesus is heaven to us. Heaven, when Jesus came to earth, it was heaven that came down to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. And we're anchored. He is the one that's gone in behind the curtain, behind the veil. He's the anchor of the soul. He's what we hang on to in any storm. And his purpose will be accomplished. And I'll tell you one thing. He has a purpose. And he will accomplish his purpose. Our job is to hang on to him, to trust him. I love these examples from Scripture. And I'm going to just take a little uh, review of Joseph's life briefly to overview Uh, Joseph's life is an example of how things and promises were made for this young man that were incredibly great. 
that seemed to be, con everything he went through seemed to contradict everything that he believed was going to happen. You know, he was a, a person of destiny, Joseph, one of 12 children of Jacob. Um, he was the, the man that had they called him the dreamer, Joseph the dreamer. God, as a young man, promised him. He had visions of greatness. His life was destined to fulfill something great for God's purpose in God's kingdom. Problem is, uh, his brothers were quite jealous of him. And so the more, of course, he shared about he had these dreams, the more angry and hateful they got towards him to the point where they wanted to murder him. They, in fact, they didn't murder him, but they threw him in a pit, killed a goat, took the coat, clothes off his back, put blood on it, and showed it back to Jacob, his father. And Jacob was convinced that uh, Joseph had been killed. But God had spared Joseph's life. He got sold to Midianites and uh, Ishmaelites, who brought him down to Egypt, and he was working as a slave. So can you imagine this young man who had this sense of greatness, this sense of destiny that God had given him? This is going completely the opposite of where he was going. Can we relate to that? Can we say that when we started off the Christian faith, we were so gung-ho, we were so excited, we sensed that God had a calling for our life, and then problems came in. Those problems were not the impediment to get us to where God wanted us. They were the catapult to get us to where God wanted us to go. We have to get God's perspective on the events of our life, not as roadblocks. Do you know that no one and no thing can stop you when you're surrendered to God's will? Nothing can stop you from getting to where God wants you. The key is trusting and surrendering to God, believing God. It doesn't mean it's not frustrating. It doesn't mean it's easy. But it means that God has a bigger picture. And God does something wonderful when we go through trials. It's called he brings us to humility. We cannot depend on our own ability to get us to that place, but we can depend on God. So let's take a look. Joseph's now sold into slavery. Genesis 39.1 says this. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he had did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him, and he made him overseer over his house and put him in charge of all that he had. Finally, after such bad circumstances, he can breathe. He's now at least got a good position. He's got a good master. And so uh, things are turning around. So, okay, that's great. Uh, Joseph, things are starting to turn around for Joseph. I love what it says, that the Lord was with Joseph. God is with us in our deepest and our darkest times. That's the promise of Psalm 23, verse 4, even though you walk through a valley, through a dark place, through a place of difficulty. He's with us. Isn't that the most wonderful pressure? We can do this because the Lord is with us. We can do this. So he finally gets this break, and then all of a sudden Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph. Big problem. Big problem. And she tries to seduce him. But you know what's amazing? He says that he will not sin against God or man. He held on to his integrity. Now you think about it. He could say, life's crummy. I've been dealt. Finally, he's lonely. He's in a bad place. And finally, someone gives him a little attention, but he didn't give in to the temptation because he was holding on to a vision from God for his life, and this would compromise that vision because he knew who he was. It's so important to be rooted in your identity. Your identity in Christ is not based on your circumstances. It's not based on your position. It's not based on your money. It's based on the promises of God and your new creation in him, and God's got a plan. Hold on to that. Because that's what holds on to your integrity. It says, without a vision, Proverbs 29, 4, the people perish. They perish because they let go and get discouraged and they compromise and they walk after the flesh. God doesn't want us to do that. Joseph knew what he was destined for in spite of the circumstances. He never let go of God. That's the picture for us. Hold on to God, whatever you're going through. So then he, he gets a falsely accused that's kicking the teeth after you've been getting kicked while you're down. Joseph was kicked, couldn't get worse. All of a sudden, he's just starting to finally get of a break, and he thinks, oh, this will be my new. But that was, God didn't want him comfortable where he was. He was thrown into prison after being falsely accused of rape. That's pretty rough. 
You could, you'd be pretty bitter. I think you'd be pretty bitter at uh, that kind of false accusation. But he held on to his integrity. Um, look what it says now in verse, uh, chapter 39 of Genesis, starting in verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. That's God's favor. That is God's favor. So even at his lowest point, God was with him. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Wow. God was with him. Even though he was kicked while he was down, he was falsely accused, he went down and he went down and he went down. But the Lord was with him. And of course, he had those two prison mates. He gave the interpretation. One didn't work out so well for the, ba the baker. He was dead three days later. But the butler, who had the interpretation of his dream for, was returned to Pharaoh. But it says this, Joseph said to the butler, remember me before Pharaoh. The butler forgot. Here's one thing. Joseph could not set his appointment for freedom until God set him free. You can't fix yourself from your own circumstances. You can try. Oh, you can say, oh, remember me. Do this for me. Or, you know, we try hard to fix ourselves. It doesn't mean we don't act responsibly with what we have. I'm not saying that. Be faithful with what you have. But you can't set yourself free from your circumstances. Only the Lord can. But it said two full years. I'm sure those were full years in prison. Egyptian prison wasn't fun times. But God was teaching Joseph to depend on him alone to be set free. Two full years later, Pharaoh has a dream. All of a sudden, the butler says, oh, yeah, there was a guy in prison. Uh, let me tell you about him. Joseph gets called up. He interprets not only Pharaoh's dream, but Pharaoh says, okay, who is wiser than this man? I'm going to put you second in charge. Guess what? He was now at the place. Joseph, instead of being hindered by the imprisonment, instead of being hindered by sold and slavery, those were the very instruments that God used to put him because he could be trusted. See, God's concerned about our character. God's concerned about our character. And it's necessary to go through things that humble us in order to depend on God and transform us within. Now, it's the Spirit of God within us that transforms us. It's not the circumstances. But as we respond to God in the circumstances, it allows the Spirit of God to understand and grow and walk with Him. It's a relationship God's inviting us into. And the good news this morning, and I want to tell you, whatever you've been through, Maybe you haven't been as good as Joseph and you've been through trials and temptations and he gave into it. I got good news this morning. Get up, Bambi. You don't have to stay down. Repent. God wants us to get up, turn from our sin, and trust him. And he will still. He hasn't given up. That's why we're talking about this. The, the, the message of Jonah that our dear Pastor Ashwin shared uh, a month ago was a beautiful way of saying that even when we fail and we return to the Lord, he gets us back on course. Isn't that good news? I love that message of Jonah. In fact, I said the first service, I had a whale of a time listening to it. I know it sounds a little fishy, but, um, uh, but the point is, is there's hope. And that hope in the Bible is, is not something that's a possibility. It's a sure thing, and that hope is in Christ. And our faith is anchored to hope. Uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You might not see, Joseph didn't see how God would deliver him from his circumstances, but he didn't stop trusting God, and God brought about what he couldn't do himself, and God will do the same for you. And I'll tell you one thing, when God brings about the very things in your life that you know that you couldn't do, you'll never take credit for it. That's true humility. It's not putting yourself down, it's putting God and other people first. That's what I love that acronym, joy. Jesus, others, yourself. It's by having the right focus, we're, paid, we're placed. It's about Jesus. It's about other people. And so God is not going to give up on you. But the end of the story is the best. It's, it's this end of Joseph's life story. When his brothers finally came to him, there was a famine in the land. His brothers had to come down. They didn't even recognize Joseph. And Joseph revealed him. Can you imagine? This is the guy you threw into prison. You wanted to kill. You hated him. And what a reckoning. Listen to this in Genesis 45, starting in verse 4. 
So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land two years and there are five years left in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you that sent me here. It was not you that sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. Wow. It wasn't you that sent me here. See, he didn't blame his brothers. I think that's kind of amazing that he had that attitude. That's the attitude of Christ. Think of the people that were crucifying Jesus and on the cross in the height of agony and pain and bitterness in the way they treated him. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He says, while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. That's Joseph is illustrating the life of Christ for us. It's about Jesus. And Genesis 15, 19 to 21, I love this. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. But listen to these last words. Thus, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Can you imagine speaking to someone that's your most hateful enemy that wants to destroy your life and you have the opportunity and if you had the power to destroy them and Joseph had all that power, he could have gotten revenge. He turned it for blessing. That's Jesus. That's the life of Christ. Can you imagine the very things you're going through are the very thing God wants to use as an instrument? Paul Bildheimer wrote a book called Don't Waste Your Sorrows. And in this book, he says, when we recognize that our sorrows are instruments for God to have an eternal purpose, and we cooperate with that purpose by faith and trusting him, God will use it. Don't waste it. We're all going to go through sorrows. Life's inevitable. There's suffering, there's pain, there's disappointment in life. But look at it from God's perspective. The most beautiful thing about Joseph at the end of Jacob's life, Joseph brought his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, to be blessed by Jacob. Jacob was blind at this point, and so you always bless, the, the, the higher blessing goes to the firstborn. It's just the way it is. The, the double portion goes to the firstborn. And so he had these two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was the oldest, and as he was praying for him and he was blind, he crossed his hands. So Joseph said to his father, oh, you've got the dad. It, it's the other way around. I got, I got Manasseh. on the, He said, no, no, I'm not making a mistake, my son. He says, the, the, the older boy will be blessed, but the younger one will be more blessed. Guess what he did? He had that, that X, the Chi. He was prophetic onto the life of Joseph. What did he say Manasseh meant? Manasseh says, I'll forget all the suffering in my father's household. And Ephraim means God has made me fruitful in the land. Ephraim in Hebrew means double fruitfulness. I love the way Apostle Paul puts it, forgetting those things that are behind. Forget, things come first. We have to forget first. But fruitfulness ahead of us. We keep our focus on the high call of the prize in Christ Jesus. It's that chi, it's that perspective of getting God's perspective of forgetting those things are behind because they will hold us back. We don't live in the past. Let's keep pressing on to the high call of the mark in Christ Jesus. That's where fruitfulness comes. It's in the relationship that we have with God. It's in walking with God that fruitfulness comes out of a relationship with the Lord. What a beautiful picture of that chiasm. And it was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus was seen as the biggest failure in his time. This guy who was supposed to lead his people as a Messiah from the revolt and set up the kingdom of God was crucified as a criminal. How could that ever be God? But from God's perspective, it was the greatest victory of all time. It was the very thing that God used. That was that man's perspective and God's perspective. This morning, I'd like you to take a look at God's perspective for your life. I want to say three things about the trials you're going through, and I'm going to conclude. They're temporary. Trials are temporary. Two, God has a purpose in those trials. And three, they will have an eternal benefit. I love the way Paul says this, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I'd like to get God's perspective on who you are, knowing that you're absolutely and unconditionally loved by God. But my, I have a bigger question this morning. Is the Lord your shepherd? Have you received Christ as your Savior? Do you know Jesus personally? And if you're not sure you can say that, I want to just tell you uh, what it means to accept Christ. There's really, I call them the ABCs of the Christian faith. Three things you need to know. The first thing is you have to admit you're a sinner. You know, when we say we're not worthy, it's not putting ourselves down. It means we can't earn God's approval. It's only by the perfection of what God did for us. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, the Bible says. So we have to admit that we are and will never be good enough in our own abilities or strength to make ourselves right with God. Cannot do it. The second thing is, B, believe that Jesus, that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die at the cross for our sins. He shed his blood for our sins and he rose from the dead. So he paid the price that we could not pay. But the third thing is commit your life to Christ. That means that we not only have head knowledge that Jesus died for our sins, but we enter in relationship. We respond to an invitation by God himself that says, come, come, come freely and drink of the water. Christ paid for you what you could never do for yourself, but you have a choice to make. And that choice we call faith. And that's choosing to ask Christ to forgive you, come to your life, and turn away from your sin, that you want to walk in a new life. You can't do it in your own strength, but you're not earning it, you're receiving it. So I'm going to pray a little prayer this morning. I want to say three things. If you're not ready, you don't believe it or you don't want to, please don't pray the prayer. The prayer won't save you. But if in your heart you're saying, I would like that, you can pray this prayer with me. Let's just pray now. Father, thank you that Jesus Christ, your son, died for my sins and rose from the dead. I'm not good enough to earn your salvation. But I ask on the basis of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection to forgive me of all my sins and come into my heart. I surrender it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.